Ni hao, and happy Thursday. Today we're going to be talking about the end of the dynasties in China. Your textbook should be turned to page 757 as we talk about this section. Open up to page 757. 757. While you're flipping there, I thought I would like to talk to you about my favorite animal, which is also, I believe, Josie's, which is the panda. This is my stuffed panda that I actually did not get in China. I got in Suriname from a former student. I did get the nesting doll pandas in China, but I call this guy Mendeleev, which is actually named after a Russian chemist. Chinese person, but Mendeleev is going to tell you about pandas. When you think of an animal associated with China, you might think of a dragon, but you also might think of the panda. In the past, pandas were thought to be rare and noble creatures, and mentions of it have popped up in ancient Chinese history, but there aren't any really specific depictions of an animal that looks like a panda. Although there have been mentions of bears, no pre-20th century artistic portrayals of pandas are known. Instead, they have mythological creatures that slightly resemble a panda, but not quite there. I'm a very unique looking guy. Europe first learned of the giant panda on March 11, 1869, when the French missionary Armand David received a panda skin from a hunter. German zoologist Hugo Weichold purchased a live panda cub in 1916. Theodore Roosevelt Jr. and his brother became one of the first Westerners to shoot a panda on a hunting expedition. Shoot a panda! Gifts of pandas have been sent out from China to American and Japanese zoos as a form of diplomacy or keeping peace. 24 pandas were given out this way. However, this practice ended in 1984. Pandas, oh, sorry. Pandas are now offered out as um, two countries on 10 year loans for the cost of $1 million a year. Any children born to those pandas, panda babies, are also considered on loan from China. China has established nature reserves for the pandas in the country to help preserve the amount that they have. There are laws prohibiting the hunting of pandas. A Chinese farmer was even given a life imprisonment sentence for shooting a panda in 1995. And two men were put to death in 1996 for being caught with panda pelts. In 1997, the penalty for poaching was reduced to a 20 year prison sentence. So we've learned, don't mess with pandas. We're protected by China's government. And we're special. And we're cute. Right, guys? Back to you, Mrs. Bullwark. Thanks, Mendeleev. All right. Hopefully we enjoyed that little tidbit. And we are on page 757. And we're ready to talk about the end of dynasties in China. On Tuesday, we talked about the dynasties in China and how they had established a lot of power and even unified China. Well, China's last dynasty was the Qing dynasty. In 1839, the Qing dynasty fought with Britain over the trade of opium. Opium is an addictive drug that Britain had been trading for Chinese tea. Opium comes from the milky sap of a flower called the opium poppy. The earliest we have heard about it was from Mesopotamia, around 3400 BC. It was referred to as the joy plant by ancient Sumerians. Opium cultivation even was in ancient Greece and ancient Egypt and was said to have healing powers. Opium was used to help people sleep, to relieve pain, and to calm crying children. Sometimes if you had to have surgery... You, sorry, excuse me. You took opium to help with the pain, but not today. Oh, I have the hiccups. Opium was introduced to China. 
<laughs> Sorry. Opium was introduced to China and East Asia in the 6th and 7th century AD through trade along the Silk Road, which connected the Mediterranean to Central Asia, India, and China. Great Britain had conquered a part of India in the 1700s and used it to bring opium into China. They used the profits from selling opium to buy tea, silk, porcelain, and bring it back to Europe. Because of this opium addiction, opium is in the same category as um, morphine and heroin. So opium addiction increased significantly in China. The Qing Dynasty attempted to outlaw bringing opium into the country and growing it in order to fight this addiction, which was ruining the people in their country. This caused the First Opium War. Great Britain sent warships and attacked some Chinese cities. China did not have the military strength to stop them, and Great Britain forced China to accept the opium trade. They also lost Hong Kong to the British as well during this time. Poor guys. Great Britain would later join forces with France against China to have the Second Opium War, where they further limited the control of China's Qing Dynasty. China also ended up losing Taiwan to Japan after a war in 1895. Taiwan belonged to Japan through World War II until the end, when Japan lost. Chinese people blamed the Qing Dynasty for the country's weakness, and in 1911 and 1912, revolutionaries took power from them, hoping to transform China into a strong modern nation. The Nationalist Party of China um, took over, and you can see in your textbook on page 757, the first person in charge of this was Dr. Sun Yat-sun, yat -san, who was the first person of the Nationalist Party to took control of China. They had hoped to make China into a strong, modern nation. However, China then entered into what can be described as a civil war for 30 years of constant fighting, followed by Japan attacking them in World War II. Another party, the Communist Party, which we're going to talk about tomorrow, also fought for control over China and the government. The Nationalists at this time were led by... I'm sorry. The Nationalists at this time were led by Zhang Jishu, who is also known as Chiang Kai-shek. And the communists were led by Mao Zedong. The Nationalist Party wanted to strengthen Chinese identity, but modernize at the same time. Zhang Jishi, or Chiang Kai-shek, was a dictator, but his party said that they wanted to form a democracy. Eventually, however, after that civil war of fighting, the Communist Party, um, pushes Chiang and his followers of the Nationalist Party out of mainland China to the island of Taiwan. There they set up the Nationalist Party, which is still around to this day. There were a little bit in 2000 where it was a democracy, but now it is, it is back. Um, the start of the Communist Party in China then began in 1949 with establishing the People's Republic of China. This ended what some Chinese call the century of humiliation in China, where they lost wars and didn't develop their military and fought each other. Um, something to be, in Chinese history, maybe humiliated by. Century of humiliation. The Qing Dynasty also controlled much of Mongolia. However, Mongolia's communist leaders won independence from China in 1921, and Mongolia became a new independent nation. And that's where we're at. We're ending the end of Chinese history tomorrow. We're going to finish the section talking about China and Mongolia under communism, a government that still exists in China today. I hope you've enjoyed today learning about pandas and the end of the dynasties. At this time, you should reread this section. Don't forget to submit this assignment to show me that you have watched this video. Also, you are able to complete questions 8, 9, and 13 in your notes at this time. Your section notes are due Friday at 11.59 p.m., but you are more than welcome to turn them in ahead of time. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye! Do you want to say bye, Mendeleev? Bye!